One of the problems with every pandemic is that in the beginning, people just can't believe it's going to happen or they don't believe it's going to happen to them. They don't really believe until somebody they know or they themselves are hurt by it. I mean, in the early days of the pandemic, I had the hardest time getting anybody at the Times to believe me. I was in a meeting with the business editors who were talking about what happens now that flights from China have been canceled. And I listened for a while to the discussion and finally got exasperated and said, you don't understand. This isn't just going to be China. This is going to affect the whole world. And a business editor looked at me and said, are you saying that everything might shut down? I said, yeah, maybe just in my face and turned away. That's a serious drawback in the beginning of every pandemic because the crucial thing is how fast you react in the early days of a pandemic is everything. It's out of control very quickly. Fatalism is another thing that comes in. You get this kind of sense of, oh, there's nothing I can do about it. It's gonna get me anyway. And so people don't take the measures they need to do. In AIDS in the United States, you know, in the early days, a lot of men, even when tests came about, just did not wanna get tested because in those days, Finding out you were HIV positive was a death sentence. So many men chose not to get tested and they were basically just hoping that they weren't infected and hoping that if they were infected, they weren't passing it on to anybody they loved. And in fact, you know, we ended up with 600,000 dead in this country, partially because of that fatalism, because people just didn't want to know. Every pandemic I have ever covered has been just beset with rumors and it's gotten worse and worse. With COVID, People accepted the idea that the virus was the cause of the disease, but they then rejected almost everything else about it. They began to believe that the vaccines were dangerous or the vaccines didn't work or the vaccines had never been tested or the vaccines gave you swollen testicles. They began to believe that the vaccines magnetized you or, or put microchips in your blood so that, so that Bill Gates could trace you. And all these rumors, you know, meant that at one point, nearly a third of the United States was resisting getting vaccines and using some other alternative method. And so, by my guess, about 450,000 people died in this country who didn't need to die. I said to a friend of mine once, the longer I cover diseases, the more of a public health fascist I turn into. And he said, Donald, do, do not ever say that. Do not ever write that down. That's so politically incorrect. And I said, no, that, that's how I feel. People need to save themselves and yet they don't. And they need to save the others around them. If they don't protect themselves against diseases, they end up passing on that disease to others. And I think sometimes people need to be compelled to do that because they can't be convinced to do that. And that's a strong element in my book. I'm very much in favor of mandates. And one of the aspects of this that's tough is that every time a disease starts out, it starts out inside one small network of people. And the minute public health officials try to move on that network to stop the disease, they will be accused of bigotry. The truth is you have to protect the first victims of the disease, not just so they don't spread it to others, but you have to protect them from the disease itself. And sometimes that requires being very tough with that small group. And you have to, you have to crack down. I mean, you have to do it in as humane a way as possible, but you have to be insistent about stopping a disease before it spreads because you save lives. And as far as I'm concerned, saving lives is the name of the game in public health. <laughs>